noted, this evening will be held in English. Um, and so that's I got them. כמדי שנה עמותת זוכרות מארגנת אירוע בערב יום העצמאות הישראלי. תאריך שאותו אנו רואים כחשוב במיוחד לציין ולהנכיח בו את עוגות הנקווה, ודווקא בערב הזה יש חשיבות לדבר על, הן על הפליטות והן על השיבה. עכשיו אני אעבור לאנגלית, אם יש מישהו בעיות באנגלית או משהו אז תגידו לנו ואנחנו נשמח uh, להיות לעזר. My name is Yael, uh, thank you for coming. Israel is uh, marking its uh, 68th Independence Day. The Chot has a long tradition in organizing events on, on, on this day, commemorating the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe that started in 1948, with the destruction of hundreds of villages and cities resulting in hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees. Today, there are 7 million refugees, and for 68 years, Israel has been constantly preventing them to return. The Chot works to promote recognition and responsibility taking by Jewish Israeli society for its part in the ongoing Nakba and realize the return of Palestinian refugees as the necessary readdress of the Nakba. Today, especially, we see a great importance to talk about the refugees and the return. And we are very happy to welcome Tina Yarvi as um, a social activist and a doctoral student of social anthropology at the University of Tampere. Finland. Her lecture, Hoping for Return, her talk, I think, would be more of an yeah, informal yeah. discussion. Um, but I think if there is a framework, which I think is a very nice sentence also that you uh, wrote, Hoping for Return, Planning for Migration, the Dreamed and Assumed Futures Among Palestinian Refugees in Southern Lebanon, uh, which is part of her doctoral work uh, focusing on Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, West Bank, and Jordan. Um, in this specific lecture, we'll be uh, Tina will talk about the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and will present impression of her last visit <coughs> uh, there that took place in the end of 2015. Before I give you the floor, I will mention a few more things. Okay. Um, the first part is, those of you who can see, there are some photographs here, which is part of a project that the Zohar did in 2008, called it what the name of it was Bridging Memory, and it was in collaboration with the organization in Lebanon. The goal of the project was to bring the refugees' memory from the destroyed village of Ras al-Ahmar into Israel territory, and in particular to the land of the village itself, which nowadays is called Moshav Kerem Benzin, which was established in 1949. Um, part of the idea was uh, the, 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 the activists uh, that were in Lebanon in En took photographs of the refugees from there, and then uh, in, in, in an online project, they placed the photographs in their destroyed villages uh, here, which is now Israel too. So I thought it's also very much relevant, I think, what we talking about also about like, yeah. food, food, photos from the Palestinian refugees uh, nowadays. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's pleasure, my pleasure. I was actually going to come here already a month, a month and a half ago when there was the conference of return, but then I happened to fell ill just when I was supposed to travel. So um, even for that reason, I'm very happy to be here today because I'm going to talk about quite the same issues I would have been talking about in the conference. Uh, and as Yael already mentioned, I'm a doctoral student in in University of Tampere, and uh, I'm doing my PhD study on Palestinian refugees living in the three different. Like I'm concentrating on three different countries in Lebanon, here in Israel, Palestine, in the West Bank area, and then in Jordan. And at the moment, I'm doing my fieldwork here in Bethlehem. I'm staying in the Isha camp. There, at the moment, I've been here about two weeks so far, so I'm in the very beginning here, but uh, I was living in Lebanon like for a year and a half, and then I was there doing two months field work at the end of the last year in the city of Sur or Tyre, like in the in English pronunciation. Um, and uh, I was like living with a Palestinian family over there, uh, fam the family was from Haifa, and they they are living in the gathering in the Sur, 
in the in quite near the Alpas camp. Uh, but yeah, like the uh, the main themes in my in my research are the spatialities of the Palestinian like the spatialities Palestinian refugees dwelling at the moment and how those fatalities affect the ways that they are able to imagine their future. And right of return is of course one of these aspects, but like it like it can, comes up quite different ways in different places. Like depending on how the how the lived conditions of the Palestinian refugees are. And the Lebanonese well, even the Palestinian refugees have been talking here, they mentioned that when I say that I've been in Lebanon living with the Palestinian refugees, they say that it's the worst place to be a Palestinian. Because, like, well, many historical and social reasons, uh, uh, like, the, and, like, the Palestinian refugees who are living in, living in Lebanon are mainly from the, well, the northern part of historic Palestine. And as, yeah, also mentioned a bit, they, they moved to Le <coughs> they fled to Lebanon because of Annapa in 1948, and here you can see, see like so there is Sue where I was doing the field work, and it's actually very close to the border, so it's maybe 20 kilometers or less from from here, and you can actually see the border from from the city itself. And I did the field work in three different camps and several several gatherings. I will like explain a bit what is the difference in a while. But there are there are three camps in Sur Al Bas, which is quite small camp. Then there's Al Hashidiyah, which is the second biggest camp in Lebanon after Ain Al Hilwa, which is inside a bit bit north from Sur. And then there's Gush Shamali camp. And on top of these camps, which are the official recognized places of Palestinian dwelling by the UNRWA and UN. Uh, there are close to 10 gatherings in the Vin city, city of Sur. And gatherings are, well, they are places where there are only Palestinians, mainly Palestinians, living there, like, well, as the word itself explains, they are gathered in the same places where there are only Palestinians, but they are not recognized by UNRWA or you, like, and they're, like, there, and also, like, by the state of Lebanon, their, like, position is quite precarious, and those places are usually built on lands owned by the government or, well, like, or private, like, like, privately owned land, and this creates also well, precariousness to those places because they are not recognized officially, so they can be demolished at any time, and they are not maintained in the same ways as the camps are. Uh, and when I was staying there in Sur, I did several interviews and also ethnographic fieldwork, like participatory observation, and uh, it became quite evident how the how the Palestinians like, what is the Palestinians position in Lebanon and also before when I was living in Lebanon like in several discussions not even with Palestinians but also like Lebanese it, like there are you could you could put together that the Palestinians are not very liked in Lebanon and there are many reasons for this one of the biggest reason is the that the Palestinians um, pose a threat to the sectarian system in Lebanon. So Lebanon is built around this system that the power is divided along sectarian lines. And Palestinians, as a mainly Sunni Muslim presence, they put a, they challenge this like very fragile balance that there is bet there is between the different sects. And the Pal for this reason. Palestinians are not granted any of the civil rights uh, because that would it, it's, it is believed that it, that would undermine the, the power balance in the country. And uh, Palestinian, like for example, in Jordan, Palestinians do have the citizenship, and from that they can enjoy different 
different rights in the country, but in Lebanon they continue to be denied the citizenship, even though like they've been living for, there for generations already, and may, most of them are born there. And also if you compare, for example, to West Bank and Jordan, in Lebanon majority of the Palestinians continue live inside the camps. And this is like mainly because the Palestinians are they are not allowed to own land or houses outside the camps. And also because like the Palestinian camps they form quite quite like distinct spaces from the surrounding Lebanese areas. And this this is like mainly from from the times when PLO arrived to Lebanon from Jordan uh, in 19, 1969, when there was this uh, Cairo agreement that put PLO in power in the camps. And that also made, meant that the, that the Lebanese authorities are not allowed to enter the camps. So they form this kind of, uh, well, in a way, anomaly in the country in that they are not governed by the country in which territories they are. And even nowadays when the Cairo agreement is abolished, it was after the civil war ended, but still the Lebanese authorities, they do not enter the camps and they don't uh, take care of any, like, anything, they don't look after anything that's happening inside the camps. And so even though PLO left from Lebanon when Israel occupied southern, southern Lebanon in 82. So there's been this like power vacuum in the camps since then in a way. And also like there are two different types of camps in Lebanon. Like you can say that there's closed camps and open camps. And those camps that I stayed in the in Sur, they are closed camps. That means that I have to apply for a permit to enter the camp. Everyone else except Lebanese citizens and Lebanese Palestinians have to get a permit to get to the camps. That means also those Syrian Palestinians who are nowadays living in the camps, since they were forced to flee from Syria, uh, they have to apply for a permit every three months to be able to continue to like, enter there and continue living there, even though if they are renting a house from there. But still, if, like the, if the general security of the of Lebanon like denies the permit then they are not anymore allowed to enter the camp uh, and yeah and yeah yeah and just uh, interrupt me at any point if I'm not making sense or if there's something comes to your mind and you want to ask so otherwise I will end up talking too much by myself yeah <laughs> to whom you need to apply for the permit the Lebanese general security, so the Lebanese officials, okay. and uh, usually you cut it for three months at a time, and that was also the case with me, even though I was there only for two months. So that I got this number, which I had to say to the Lebanese uh, military military personnel who are at the entrance of the camp to be able to enter there. Well, for example, to Al Bas camp, which is quite small camp, you can actually get from that like, different sites without the permit. But for example, to Al Rashidiyeh, which is quite big camp, and it's it's the one that is closest to Israel, and it's also that kind of camp where there are well, Ainel Hillway is probably the camp where there is most clashes, but also in Al Rashidiyeh, it's a bit unstable camp in that way that there there are things happening every once in a while. But yeah, to Al Rashidiyeh, you can't really get into without having the permit, because there are on each side of the camp there are military, like Lebanese military presence and then there are fields that you would have to cross to be able to get inside the actual camp. It's surrounded by a wall or...? Well, there is not, not wall, but there are like military posts on like, on different sides of the camp. Thank you. Yeah. Well, what's the point? Ah, uh, sorry, like, yeah. So, you said that the uh, authorities um, don't take any responsibility for what goes on in that camp. So what about like the infrastructure? What about things like sanitation and electricity and things like that? I mean, who's responsible for that? Uh, well, actually, maybe you can put the photos now because there you can see a bit about, for example, the <coughs> electricity that it's 
not really managed by anyone, it's just people take them. There, it is the like, Lebanese electricity company that is taking care of it, but uh, like people, the, like the sanitation and that kind of things, they are taken care of by UNOVA or then by no, none, no one. Like for example in the gatherings, because they are not like registered by UNOVA, so they are not official in that way. There are very few services provided by UNOVA. Some gatherings have the sanitation, but some, some don't. And also <coughs> other services as schooling and healthcare and uh, like water supply and that kind of things. It depends on like if UNOVA has like it's not present present in all the gatherings, and then there are also many international organizations. For example, from Denmark, there were quite a few projects uh, that have been involved in building, for example, water systems or like. Uh, uh, yeah, here you can see one gathering in Shad al-Bahar, which is inhabited mainly by Palestinian Bedouins, which is right next to the sea. And this is the type of gathering where there is actually no services by anyone. Do you get problems like with sewage in the streets and things like that? I mean, hygienic problems. With yeah, yeah, health yeah, yeah. Of course, this is quite a small gathering, so it's not that, not that big problem there. But of course, and also like the houses here are in very bad condition, and the Lebanese government prohibits Palestinian from repairing the houses. So there is water coming inside the houses or every winter when it's raining, and yeah, like some. Sometimes some international organizations come and do some, like, uh, they repair some houses, but it's been less. I mean, like, one reason for that is because the Syrian refugees have a right to Lebanon, so most, most of the funding goes to, goes to that and not that much anymore to Palestinians living in the country. Yeah, and. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I, I, ah, I'm, yes. not sure, I'm not sure I understood the, the reason why it's prohibited uh, to enter those camps. Uh, well, there is. Yeah, it's, uh, they are in a way seen as certain security threats. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there are like historical reasons why the camps have been separated from and the PL, like the presence of the PLO is and because they they have not been uh, like governed by Lebanon so there has been like a border in the camp but yeah like, I don't know why it's why it is that some camps are like this and other camps are not for example in Beirut uh, Shatila and <coughs> Shatila and Bursar Berasni camps you can enter them as well as uh, Mar Elias camp which is quite small camp but still you can get there without getting a permit but especially when you come to the southern Lebanon you need to have permits to enter the camps it makes sense if they don't let them out hmm? but, if, but why not let them in? <laughs> yeah, they, the Palestinians do like can go in without permit like the Lebanese Palestinians Syrian Palestinians don't they need the permit and also Lebanese citizens can enter the camps without permit but only very few Lebanese actually want to enter the camps because they are seen as very like unsafe places. And for example, there were a few times when I was going to a camp, going to a camp, and I took a service, uh, like shared taxi. And when I mentioned where I'm going, and if the driver was a Lebanese, they didn't want to take me, and like wished me God's protection because I was entering such a uh, such an dangerous place from their perspective and in, like in, in Lebanon in general the division between the local population and Palestinians it's very strong uh, mainly like because of these things that I explained that uh, Palestinians are not granted rights because they are seen as a threat to the to the political system but also from the civil war which is widely blamed on Palestinians seen that Palestinians are the reason why the civil war started because the PLO was attacking uh, attacking Israel from the soil of Lebanon so that's like many see that as a reason and that comes up in the conversations like in like very uh, like for example in taxis people have just started to talk about Palestinians and uh, like how they have like what things that they the things that they, they have done to the country and make the country less 
less safe. Even if, like, if you look at Lebanon, it's not, it's very complicated place in general, and the presence of Palestinians isn't really the biggest problem the country has. But still, it's generally looked in that way that the Palestinians are cause for everything bad that happens in the country. But if you generalize a bit, but this is like the this is the impression that you get. And for example, during the last uh, November, it was when I was doing fieldwork, there was this double suicide attack in Pursilbar, near Pursilbarasne camp in southern Lebanon. And it was like the first reaction was to blame Palestinians. And you could see that, you could really tell that Palestinians have internalized this assumption that they will be blamed because right after it had happened and no one had even said anyone, like no one had even mentioned who is responsible, uh, but still the Palestinians started to talk to me that uh, it, it can't be Palestinians, it must be someone else, the, the surname of the person who did the attack is it's something that's so that kind of name that you can't find among the Palestinians. So they were started to defend themselves like straight away even before they were actually blamed. And then there were actually few like few assaults of Palestinians from Bursalbarasni camp after the attack after the suicide attack. And then the the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, said in the speech that it weren't the Palestinians, we have to like be united and things like that, and then it calmed down. But like the first reaction was to blame the Palestinians for the attack. And, well, oh yeah, and here you can see the, a bit about the infrastructure of the, of the camps. It's very narrow roads and, uh, and also the electricity, it's just, take, like, it's not really that well. <laughs> Well installed, and here also you can see from the from the pole. Uh, but yeah, well, where was I? Yeah, like the maybe the main thing that came up every time when I was talking with Palestinians uh, was that they wanted to emigrate emigrate from the country, and the reason for that is partly the social isolation they experience in the country because of all this well, historical and social reasons, but also because Palestinian refugees are prohibited to work in over 70 employments altogether. Uh, they can't own houses, as I mentioned, they can't inherit houses from their parents, even if their parents had, would have bought, like, from uh, bought a house. Uh, so, and now when the economical situ economic situation of Lebanon is getting worse, and also because the arrival of Syrian refugees who had taken the jobs that Palestinians have been able to do before, and because they are doing it cheaper than the Palestinians were doing, so there are very limited options options for Palestinians to continue living in Lebanon. Because there is no work, even if you are on top of your class and graduate from university with very good grades, you can't be a lawyer, you can't be a doctor, you can't work. Uh, as in, like, in a profession, employment, except inside the camps. And of course, there are very, like, very few places you can actually work inside the camps. And especially nowadays, when UNRWA is cutting its services all the time, so there are less and less options for Palestinians. And also, the like cuts from UNRWA make it more difficult for Palestinians to get the services that they need. And it has, like. For example, the the state of schools, the UNRWA schools, it's very difficult at the moment. There are too many too many students in one class, and the like quality of the education is declining. So more and more people are thinking that there are no options for them available in Lebanon, and all, so this has made the immigra immigration like. The only option they see that is available for them, that they can actually like make a change in their lives and achieve a better future for themselves and for their children. And they're like, I'm not actually even exaggerating, but it came up in every conversation in one way or another. Even if the person was 
him or herself like wishing to stay, he, he, they knew someone who has left. Right? They knew someone who uh, was planning to leave, and they were thinking if they were like even if they want to stay, is it possible for their children to stay? Because there are no options like to make to get a work and to like build a better life for their families. Uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned Nasrallah, mm -hmm. um, and uh, obviously he has a, a great deal of influence in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, the impression we get in Israel is mm -hmm. that um, a lot of his antagonism, obviously there's disputed territory, but apart from that, I mean, it's most of his antagonism towards Israel is, is defending the Palestinians. So mm -hmm. I'm interested to know, like, from within Lebanon itself, it, does he not defend the rights of the Palestinian uh, so much? I mean, is it is it really from the outside that we see that? Is it not from the inside? Uh, well, in, in species, yeah, he defends Palestinians, but when it comes to actions, it's not that much. And still there are like many Palestinians, they, there are like among Palestinians, there are people who support Hezbollah because they think that still Hezbollah is the only one who is actually doing something. But still they are like inside Lebanon, they are not really doing anything. And like if there is one thing that like that pr brings all the Lebanese political parties together, it's that the Palestinians shouldn't be naturalized, that they shouldn't be given rights, that they should like, uh, they should be uh, kept in this like position of not, like, not having a citizenship or rights. Uh, so in the sp uh, political speeches, of course, he does defend Palestinian cause and, and of course talks quite a lot about Israel. But in the practice, when it comes to the policies inside the country, they are not really doing that much. And that is also one reason that Palestinians don't see that there's actually any possibilities for change inside Lebanon, that they see that, see that there is no point in staying. Even though, of course, there are voices also staying that, voices saying that we should stay, we should like, make, like, keep the camps because they are the reminder of the right of return. And this is like the political discourse, of course, which is all the time present at the same time. And even those who are leaving, they need to, need to like, uh, like take this into consideration when they are talking about leaving, that they have to men still mention that, okay, we are leaving the camps, but we are still keeping the right of return. Which is, like, I think it's true. It's not that by leaving you are, like, giving up on your hopes to return to Palestine. It's just that you don't see any possibilities in Lebanon and you, of course, want to make a better life for yourself and your children. And that's why you are leaving. And also some people were presenting emigration as a way to Palestine. That when they get to Europe, they can maybe get the citizenship of some European country. And after that, they can travel here to visit. So it was and, and that way they saw that it would be possible to come and see the places from where their families are from. And I think that also tells quite a lot about how Palestinians see the, uh, the possibilities of the return at the moment. Because, as all of you know, the, it doesn't look that it's going to happen very soon. So to be able <laughs> to at least to get the like, possibility to, to visit then you have, and even then you have to obtain a citizenship from somewhere else and you can't come here as a Palestinian. You have to hide your Palestinian refugeeness in a way to be able to get here. And yeah, I think in general, of course, they're like the right of return and Palestine, they are extremely important to people. And the Palestinian identity is very strong. The Palestinians still speak with a like, different dialect than the Lebanese, that, so they have like, they have kept that, and and uh, running out of time. No, no, it's uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and and of course, even like especially because the they are not included to the to the society to the Lebanese like to the Lebanese society. It even make, makes it even stronger the feeling of being a Palestinian, that being and also that being a Palestinian means that you suffer and you you have to struggle to get your rights. Um.
not the same as here, for example, like now that I've been in Asia and visited Ida camps, it's very different compared to like camps in, camps in, in the West Bank. Uh, there are some organizations, but they are mainly doing humanitarian work because of the situation that those are the things that people need, that they need uh, someone who can help them in like repairing their houses or things like that. And even that is like it's less than before, because as I mentioned, the, like most of the money is going to the Syrian refugees at the moment, and it also creates uh, this kind of uh, competition in a way between the two refugee groups. That Palestinians in Lebanon feel that they are abandoned by the international community now. That when there are more like fresh refugee situation going on. I'd love if you expand on like public services that go on inside the camps because you said they are governed separately from Lebanon, so like police and all that, and also uh, are goods taxed when they get in and out of the camp? Uh, not in that way, and there are like the services inside the camps are either by UNRWA and then PLO is still providing some assistance, but not that much. And yeah, it's not like separate place in that way that there would be tax. But also because they are not covered by Lebanon, there are lots and lots of illegal goods available inside the camps that you can, for example, buy cigarettes with a much cheaper price because they are not, like the tax is not included and they are able to do that kind of things. And also the camps have well, especially Ainel Hilweh is very like well well known for this. That many non-Palestinians organizations, like there have been some jihadist organizations inside the like camps, because they are not covered by Lebanon. So it's a place where they can, well, where they can actually be without, without like the Lebanese forces getting getting into there. And it has caused classes inside the camps, like in Ainel Hill, where it's been mainly not between the Palestinian factions, but between some other like groups. And maybe there are like Palestinians on the other side, but they are like. And also in Nahar al Barat camp, which is in the northern Lebanon, there were big fightings in 2007 or six. I, I think it was seven. Um, and it was between like the Lebanese forces and like uh, Fatah al Islam, which is not a Palestinian organization, but because they can exist inside the camps, so it can create this kind of confrontation and these kind of classes, classes inside the camps. And then the Palestinians are the ones who suffer. For example, Nahal Bar was partly destroyed during those fightings, and it's still not still not built, like rebuilt the places, so many of those Palestinians had to move, for example, to Ayan Hilwa, which is the biggest camp. And it makes it like, the, the, they are already overcrowded, the camps, because Palestinians can't live outside. Uh, or they can, but it's more expensive, and they can't own their own houses outside. So, yeah, like, like Palestinians, they are sometimes not the reason for the like these classes, but they are like they are they are just happen to be there, and then they end up being the ones who suffer from it. <coughs> oh yeah, this is from uh, Al Rashidiyah camp, which is the like south, most southern camp mm -hmm. camp in Lebanon, and yeah, they have built a new mosque there. And also you can see some Hezbollah flags. And also this is very common that like when people are building houses, they leave it like this because then it's a then they are able to build new floors because that's the only direction that they can build because the camps still have the same like space that they were given when they were founded after the Nakba. So the only direction that they can like they can build is is like putting more floors to the existing houses. And a lot of, but 
in an idea there is actually a bit space also like horizontally because there are the fields and they can take take land from the fields and build new houses there. Uh, yeah, this is also from an idea. And there is there is some kind of sanitation system existing there, but it's actually quite new thing. And also they were doing they were doing new roads when when I was there. Well, they were supposed to build it uh, six months or was it three three months earlier? But still, like uh, quite a while quite a while earlier than when I was there. But there had been some uh, problems because one person who was build, building the road. He got sold by another person from the camp, and then there were clashes between families uh, because the person died in that in that event. So they were like not finished when I was there, and then the winter came and it was raining and the roads were all mud. Um, yeah. Did you interview um, different generations or only first generation of uh, uh, refugees? Uh, different generations. Okay, did you find some different um, mm -hmm. thoughts, yes. feeling? Uh... Mm, yeah, there. Yeah, there were. You could say that there were some differences, but it was also more like uh, if you are you were politically active. If you were from, for example, from popular committee, that are the, like organ like organizations that are inside the camps, and they are like trying to manage them somehow. But like then, I think that was like bigger difference than the generational, because there were also older people who were talking about that we have to leave from here, that we don't have any chances for our children, that we hope to get visa to Europe to be able to live there. But yeah. But like maybe I'm generally speaking, and I have definitely mm. little knowledge than you have on the subject. But if I understand correctly, so the first generation uh, are uh, still talking about uh, more, talking mm -hmm. about the villages and talking about mm -hmm. the return, than the other generation that are of course facing it, but also facing maybe, you know, as you mentioned, first we go outside mm -hmm. and then we go back to Palestine or something like that. Yeah, and I think the, like, the biggest difference is probably that for the first generation, of course, it's more concrete, that they have seen the places, that they know the know the houses, they know the fields, because they have left from there. Yeah. And the other generations, it's as important, but it's not like in the same way. Same way, they are not able to like visualize it in the same manner, of course, because they have never been, been here. Yeah. So it's only from the tales of their grandparents and, and their parents that they can, like, they, they mo people know from which village they are from, and they know the family narratives, but of course it's different when you haven't experienced it yourself. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I think that yeah, no, of course, like maybe for the younger generations, there are more diverse ways of seeing the return. So it's not necessarily the like returning to your own village and yeah. like things yeah, yeah. like that. <laughs> and but still, like they were like, and also in general, I think like. For most of the Palestinians, from like how I see it, the like right to return is also uh, right, like right to live a dignified life, like like the possibility to get uh, like enjoy those rights that they are not able to enjoy at the moment. Yeah. So also when they are talking about Palestine and about the right of return, they are very much talking about gaining those rights that they are. They now can't enjoy. Yeah, and also the right to return, also the return to rights. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. The Palestinians in Lebanon also advocate for re receiving civil rights in Lebanon. Uh, they yeah, like they advocate for gaining the right to work, for example. That is important. But there is also this uh, this idea that they don't want to get the citizenship because then they like. They see that that would be away from the, like their, from their Palestinian identity in a way, and would undermine the right of return in some way. But yeah, they are definitely hoping to get the right to work because that is the most pressing issue 
that they are like at the moment that they're facing their everyday lives that they can't find work and because they can't find work they can't like get enough income to provide for their families and they like they can't get enough income to get married and start a family so it's the the most important thing the, the like the hardest thing that they face at the moment in Lebanon but also I think like there are of course that kind of advocacy work but more people are actually only planning to leave from the country and it's because they don't see that even if they fight for the right to work that they would be able to actually get it so it's a difficult situation in that way because well even the Lebanese people have very limited possibilities to actually change anything in the country because of the like structure of the system and also because there hasn't been elections in many years because there has been many well many many things going on and yeah so the and also many Palestinians said to me that like the Lebanese can't continue living here how could we continue <laughs> that they <laughs> Uh, that even those who should have the rights as citizens, they are, they don't see that many options. So how how would the Palestinians be able to continue there? Can you expand just a little? Bit? <coughs> yeah. How long does the talk about immigration uh, going on? Um, and do you think it has any relation about the Syrian refugee situation? Yeah, of course it has. Like the, of course there's been many Palestinians leaving for for a long time already, but especially since the Syrians arrived it's been like it's like it comes up more often and there are more people leaving because of that because it's also limits the already very like small options for finding work and also it makes the it has made the like the situation of UNRWA harder and it has uh, affected many things that like before there were for example some organizations working with the Palestinians and they were able to also also like employ some Palestinians, but it's less and less now. So of course it has affected. Yeah. Um, how I'm not sure if you mentioned that, but how do people commemorate the Nakba Day in the refugee camps, and not only in the Nakba Day, but during the year? How do they remember their villages? For example, do they give a name? Uh, of a street or a neighborhood, this is a Furi neighborhood or this is Ras al Ahmar neighborhood. Yeah. So, yeah, there are like there is, for example, uh, the Yassin school in Al Baskan, and okay. there are, for example, some shops are named after Palestinian okay. villages. And well, at least last year when I was there during the Nakba day, it was mainly folklore festivities like people were dancing dabke and they were uh, like some people made speeches and things like that but it wasn't really I expected it to be a bigger thing but yeah there were some activities but not that much and do they do, in some camps in the West Bank um, mm. the community of the village mm. is still living near one near near the other they're still not, it's not, of course not the same, but they're still doing some kind of communal work of the original village before 48. And I was wondering if it happens in, uh, in the camps in Lebanon as well. Does the, the community of the villages, through generations, manage to keep mm -hmm. connections? Not that I would know of. It didn't, break, like, uh, and people did talk about, like, how the camp, like from which village these people are and how it was that first there were people only from this village and then people from other villages arrived and sometimes it may like was a bit difficult because they had a different traditions and things like that but no like nowadays it's people might know that okay these people are from this village and we are from this but not even like everyone everyone doesn't even know that and it's not I think it's not the same in as it is in West Bank. I think in West Bank it's more, like, you can feel it more than in Lebanon. And also maybe because the, like, the events of the civil war and uh, how it affected Palestinians, they, those things also brought the Palestinians together as a group, like, separate from the Lebanese. So that might also be, like, 
and because the Palestinian identity is so divided from the uh, Lebanese identity, so they are mainly Palestinians, and inside the, like the group of Palestinians, I think there is not that, like the village, villages doesn't pay, play that big a role, I would say. Can you elaborate just a little bit more about the work situation? Because you said mm. they can't, they're not allowed to practice any of the major professions or something like that. Mm. And the impression I get is that they, they're not offered uh, much work at all. But they have to still earn a living. I mean, what kind of work are they doing and where? Is most of it in the camp? Mm. Is, 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 is most of it outside of the camp? And what kind of work uh, well, are they doing? Well, of course, the like unemployment is very high. But yeah, people are working inside the camps. They have jobs or some people are of course working in UNOVA like though the number is smaller like it's less than before and well and then there are people working on agriculture and on building and like things that you can do as a Palestinian that are not um, like doesn't require maybe like that like that much education that's the those are the uh, like especially especially in school many people work on agriculture and then there are some people who are fishers and like fishing fishermen and things like that but and but yeah if you have a university degree and you are for example an uh, an engineer there are very few options for you to actually find work that would have anything to do with your with your education. Uh, there are, you said you, they can't, uh, they do not uh, own land. Yeah, they don't work on their own land, but they are like, work like yeah, workers. Tenants? Yeah, okay. yeah. And they are working, like there are, especially in, in like the southern Lebanon, there are many like banana fields, for example, so they just work there as workers. Mm. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a demonstration against the cuts in UNOVA. And uh, it was very, very big issue. Of course, it's as well here in West Bank, it's a big issue. But I think it's, it was even more so in Lebanon because Palestinians rely mainly on the UNOVA services that there are. Like, they can of course go to the private hospitals, but they are much more expensive, and there are not much that not that much support to going like outside hospitals anymore. And yeah, there were this demonstration while I was here in Sur, and then there were some some like actions going on in Beirut, and yeah, and, and like the situation in Unruva was very much highlighted in all the conversations I had during my stay and the interviews I I did, and this is from Yasser Arafat, like. I mean, like the Memorial Day of Yasser Arafat. So they do, they do organize these kind of like political events, of course. But this was also like a person that I spent quite a lot of time with when I was was in Arashidiya. She said that that it's quite sad that there are not that many people participating anymore. That they used to be big events that everyone would come together and there would be marches and people would go go inside the camp. But now. Nowadays they are quite small, and after the band had stopped playing and the, there were no more speeches, people just cut off. Like they, only those who belong to Fatah actually went to the march. So it's yeah. yeah, and also like you can see this in the Palestinian community that it's not uh, maybe they don't believe as much to the political parties, which is understandable because of the situation. So. There is not that big festivities anymore, and not that many people are participating. Though also, like the parties are one big employer in the camps. That if mm. you can stay if you are a member in the camp, because then you get some benefits, and then you will get a salary. But if you are not a member in a party, then it's very difficult to stay. And I, like few people actually phrased it to me that you have to be in Fatah or you have to leave. That there are. They didn't see that there are many options, and this, well, this is also very related to the emigration, because Palestinian, because they don't have the citizenship, they don't possess the, like the, 
they don't have any passports, so they have this travel document, uh, which is not really like very good for traveling, because not many countries recognize it. <laughs> and especially in the last, at the end of last November, there was this new regular, because these are even nowadays written by hand. They are not like, they are not electronic in any way. That, uh, and then in the last November there was this new regulation that, that the international, I think it was the International Aviation Organization or something like that, but like the organization that like gives statements when it comes to like air traveling. Uh, they say that airport like countries should stop accepting handwritten travel documents. Though there was this, like, it was added that it should not affect stateless people and refugees, but it was, like, it leaves many, quite a lot of room for the countries to, like, decide how to actually implement, implement it, so Palestinians don't necessarily have that. They already before they didn't have that good options to travel, and nowadays it's even worse. And this also means that many Palestinians are leaving the country through irregular routes because they are not able to get visas to countries. They can. Um, I think they were able to go to Syria before, if I remember, but that's not very helpful at yeah. the moment. So, and uh, there are like some Palestinians have gotten the Lebanese citizenship inside the country, mainly from the Shia and uh, Christian communities, but also from certain villages that are very near the, Libani near the Lebanese border. And they have the Lebanese passport, even though in many like situations they are treated as Palestinians, that you can, when you like notice that, okay, this person is a Palestinian, though he or she has the Lebanese citizenship, it's very hard to get work. But they do have the passport, which makes it the need easier for them to travel because they can get to Turkey without visa. But Palestine, like Palestinian refugees in general, they can't go even there. So many have, they can go to Sudan without visa and many have really flew to Sudan and then crossed from there the desert to Libya and from there taken a boat to cross to Europe. And then some people nowadays, they even go to, to Syria and try from there to get to Turkey, and then some people leave from the uh, Tripoli, which is the north, like second biggest city in, in Lebanon, in the northern part of the country, and they take like try to go about boat from there. But yeah, like this uh, makes it extremely difficult for Palestinians to leave, even though they are in a position that they really don't have any other options than leave. And maybe there are more questions. Hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You said a little bit about the Lebanese people who are scared of getting into the to the refugee camps, and I'm wondering about this relationship between um, Lebanese people and, and Palestinian inside the refugee camp. Any kind of relationship? Are they like treat the Palestinians like um, all these re uh, relief NGO, uh, European NGOs that come to the Middle East and give money and do kind of uh, projects and just mm -hmm. get out from there? How? What? Anything? What kind? Between like, the Lebanese. Between the, the yeah, the Lebanese. Like I'm sure there are. NGOs mm. um, inside Beirut, for example, mm. that give services inside the camps. So not, not that much, much, so actually. Not sure. Yeah, not okay. that much, much actually. Yeah, there are like yeah, they are mainly Palestinian NGOs that work inside the camps, and of course they have very limited resources. Or then they are the international organizations that come there. But uh, I don't remember a single Lebanese organization working. Of course there are so totally isolated <laughs> like two Of course there are Lebanese people who are involved. So it's not like that every Liban like Lebanese person hates Palestinian. Of course it's not like that. But like in in general there is very like very like deep 
division between the people. Okay. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about um, uh, what you heard about uh, thoughts or um, wishes about return? Um, mm. I'm, I'm asking because um, we had a, we had a conference about the yeah. uh, yeah. return uh, a month and a half ago, and mm. uh, we heard during the, this conference, the last conference, uh, different. Um, different uh, researchers that uh, talking uh, did similar research to you mm. and they went and asked Brazilian refu refugees about their vision of return mm. and we we are very active uh, the support is active with mm. um, different uh, organizations inside 48 lines about yeah. um, imagining return so mm. I was wondering what uh, when we were talking about Palestine the Thing that people mention most that the situation is difficult. <coughs> I think it's not like I didn't like say to people that okay, tell me how you think of return. But we were talking about Palestine and uh, like future in general, like more in more general level, and like some people did say that they want to return to their villages, and I think it was uh, quite obvious that for everyone in. In Lebanon, the Palestine is the whole, whole historic Palestine, and the return would mean return to like those areas. But in the very practical level, I think that didn't come up that much. Even if I asked about Palestine and how they think that life would be in Palestine, the main thing that people mentioned was that we would have our rights. So that is what is the most important thing. So, that have connections with Palestinian inside? Um, yes, yeah, people do have families. Yeah, families living either in the in the 48 Palestine or in fact West Bank. And for example, I've been yeah, just yesterday I met one person who is a friend of my friend from Lebanon. So there is this kind of connection, mainly of course through internet because people don't have any other like other ways to connect <laughs> with this place because they can't come here and also there are family connections and people were like telling about their like cousins or aunts or uh, whatever relatives that are still living either in the 1948 Palestine or in West Bank so there are connections yeah but and yeah I think that those students really Effect that much the ways that they were still like speaking about the return, that the connections do exist, but that's that's it in a way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's going to be a last question. Oh, sorry. So, can I say more? Is that me? Okay. <laughs> can I say more about like, are they all Muslims or like? Different kind of religious group was secure, and is there again a kind of internal dynamics between these groups? And another question is that uh, how they access the external information, like international information, if they are limited by the uh, electricity. Sorry. So it's like, like they are living without electricity. They do have electricity, but yeah, they have the electricity. Wi-Fi. Sometimes. Yeah, of course they are connected. <laughs> So they are not living in slums in that way that there are, wouldn't be electricity or, or water coming. But of course in Lebanon even no one gets electricity like 24 hours a day, not even in Beirut. So in the refugee camps it's like you can't really tell when you have electricity and when you don't. But they do have generators so, but yeah. And of course they, like people are, of course they, get information and for example when it comes to leaving the country and emigrating people have very like they are negotiating very much with like people who have already left and then they are t checking these uh, Facebook groups that are talking about that what would be the good country country to go at the moment and uh, and also of course to when they are keeping touch to the families who are still living in 1948 or West Bank or Hassa uh, they use Everyone use WhatsApp. Like, of course, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah.
And you had the first question? Oh, yeah, um, so it's like, are they also like... Um, uh, yeah, the internal yeah. deep, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it didn't come up. Like, of course, there are Christians, and then there are some Shias, and then the majority are Sunni Muslims, but it doesn't really, it doesn't affect the community in other way than that those certain groups might have gotten citizenship at some point. But, yeah, it's not, I know, like, and of course there are some political division as well as, as well, like, in the same way as here, but I think that the reality that Palestinians are living in Lebanon, it, it, because it affects everyone in some way, so it's also maybe pushes these differences down a bit. They are denied uh, not in uh, the urban city. Because what they got is that they, they are allowed to, to own uh, either house or land uh, mm. in order to inherit. Uh, uh, of course, they cannot vote, I guess. No, no. Okay. no. Yeah. And, uh, but the Lebanese can't vote either because there are, haven't been elections in many years. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, so these are the rights? They are the uh, yeah, and of course also the like traveling, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, the working rights is the most like acute thing. And all the things that come when you are not a citizen of the country, you can also, of course buy services in the same way as everyone else, but because the economic situation of Palestinians is not very good, it's not always easy to do so. Of course, there are also differences in the Palestinian communi community in Lebanon isn't some kind of monolith that everyone would be in the same position. Of course, there are people who are like have better, better possibilities because they have more income and are better educated and they have better connections and they belong to party or things like that. So of course there are differences, but like when it comes to this like rights, rights as like that's a, like for example work and things like that, they are shared with everyone. What about marriage? I mean, if a, can a Palestinian marry a Lebanese? Does it happen? Yeah, it and does happen, yeah. Do they then become, get citizenship if they marry a Lebanese person? Yeah, well, if they marry a Lebanese man, <coughs> yes, but women can't pass the citizenship. So, and that's also, uh, at some point it was said that it's like the woman can't pass the citizenship to their children or their spouses because then all the Palestinian men would come and marry all the Lebanese women just to get the citizenship. So, yeah, like, yeah, but if you are marrying a Lebanese man, you can get the citizenship. Yeah. Could you say something about uh, your special interest? How, how did you become interested in this special uh, issue uh, of Palestinian refugees? Well, I was interested in Palestine in general, like, way back already and I have been here been here uh, quite many times but when I went to Lebanon for the first time in 2012 I think and then I got more interested also the like the reality that the refugees are living and of course like and in that way I got more interested on in the whole history and I was living in Lebanon for quite a long time so it was also, and I got to know some Palestinians from Lebanon. So in that way, in that way, I got more like in this specific issue, and also because the, and maybe to the idea of like future, I got interested because it seems that many like research deals with the past, and of course, future is much more harder to study in a way because it hasn't happened yet. But also, I think it's important thing to hear Palestinian refugees and how they, what kind of things they hope for their future and how the current conditions deny those things from them. And like in that way, also get to the issue of rights of return and get to the issue of how this whole situation should be solved. I think it's a great uh, sentence to end with. Um, thank you very much for coming, and you are more than welcome to join our next events. In